Hi, I'm Conrad Hall, and this week Hamza, Hamza, I'm not sure which way he prefers it pronounced, H-A-M-Z-A, Hamza sent me a fantastic question, so let's take a look at it. Hamza sent me a question via email, and if you're wondering how to do that, the email address is in the description below, and there is a, a lot in the description below. If you go all the way to the bottom, you will find my email address, so you can send your questions. Uh, you are also, of course, very welcome to put them in the comments below. Before we start, let me warn you, this is certainly going to be a long video. I have a clock on the wall in front of me, so I will be watching the time. But I have no expectations of being able to fit this into 20 minutes. Because Hamza's question is really quite large. Hamza's question is, how do you get value from the self-help stuff that you read or listen to or whatever? So I figure the best place to start is with what counts as self-help in the first place? Because the answer is that anything that gives you new information is actually self-help. You could be reading uh, a fiction novel. You could be reading a self-help book. You could be reading the dictionary. And I'll show you some of these in, in just a minute. The, the thing to be aware of in today's society, the most important thing of which you need to be aware is if you are looking for fast, easy, effortless, then you have no interest in self-help. I am 56 years of age at the time of recording. It's June, uh, actually June 10th, 2023. I am 56 and almost a half years of age. I have a lot of experience with self-help and none of it comes quickly. It just, it, it comes one day at a time, one decision at a time, one step at a time. And that can make it seem as though getting value from self-help is just this huge question. When really, there is only one step to getting value from anything that is self-help. Now it's a step that most people are unwilling to take and that's why you see you know populations dividing out into you know the one percent the 99 percent 20 percent 80 percent successful unsuccessful less successful uh, just before I jump into what is it how do you get value from self-help I have been told it's a good idea to share what are some upcoming videos and it's especially useful to me right now because this is the start of this channel. This is the start of me sharing information. And I would genuinely like to know, even though I'm, I'm going to give you less than I, an ideal amount of information on these, what do you think of these things as subjects? Do you want to know more about them? So three that I'm going to be developing uh, one is a video about the five needs and so there are five big high-level groups of needs survival, fun, freedom, belonging and purpose and so what the video will go into is these are what they are how do you satisfy them with that I'm thinking to do a video on PEP and POOP PEP is personal empowerment practices Poop is personal offensive obstructive practices. 
And the thing that we tend to miss is the only way to get a good garden is you need to spread a little bit of fertilizer. So pep is great. You know, pep is the sunshine and the rain. But too much sunshine, too much rain can kill the garden. Similarly, poop is the fertilizer that you get in life. Fertilizer that you get for your garden. And if you put the wrong fertilizer on your garden, or if you put too much fertilizer on your garden, that's bad for the garden too. And the third is will actually be a set of videos. It will be all about my story. Because I would expect, right now, uh, this is the sixth episode that I am putting together for Cranium X Rectum. And it would occur to me that folks will be wondering, who am I? Why am I doing this? What is it that in any way, shape, or form makes me qualified to do this? And it'll be a set of videos because, well, my story is 56 years long. There is a lot in it, and what I want to do is focus on stages or epochs, E-P-O-C-H-S, epochs, in my life. So basically, before I was 12 years old, from 12 to about, well, 12 to 20s, then a period in the military, uh, then having both come out of the military and experienced a, uh, a fatal car crash and then split the rest of my life up into a couple of sections. So there is a lot to cover. Uh, let me know what you think of those ideas. Any of them strike your fancy? Any suggestions for them? Perhaps mentioning some of them stimulates questions for you. So, back to how do you get value? There is one step to getting value from anything that is helpful to you, and that is take action. You have to do something with it. Just having information is useless. Okay? It's the very definition of useless. Until you put it to use, make it useful, it is useless. It is being unused. Now, that said, I have a note here that's supposed to precede that little re revelation about three things that influence how much help you are likely to get from something that is self-help. So, I'm just quickly checking. Yes, this is the point. So, I have several examples of self-help materials here. And... The three things that influence how much, you help, how much help you get from any of them are your age, how old are you at the time that you're reading it, your attitude, who you are when you are reading it, and your aptitude. How often have you consumed this material? So, let's start with some examples of self-help stuff. You will hear me mention the dictionary often. This is my dictionary. It is an Oxford Universal Dictionary. Okay. It's big. It's really heavy, too. <laughs> it is a self-help tool. Now, this might sound crazy to you. You might wonder, why on earth would I do that? It becomes a self-help tool when you sit down and read it, when you sit down and use it. And I can give you a couple of illustrations really quickly. Uh, one is this whole idea that language develops and you know, new words get added to language. Well, the dictionary that I have, that I just showed you, was first published in 1933. And the word self-esteem is in this dictionary. However, the word self-image is missing from this dictionary because in 1933, the word self-image was not part of the English lexicon. It, you know, it took until Dr. Maxwell Maltz 
published Psycho-Cybernetics and talked about a psychology for developing the self-image before self-image, the word, found a place in the English lexicon. In another direction, uh, and this is one that I will eventually do a video about, one of the words in the dictionary from 1933 is gender, and we hear a lot about gender today. Well, gender, as defined in the dictionary, has nothing to do with sex. So sex, the idea of male and female, determines gender, but gender has two definitions. One is referring to the male and female versions of words. And if you speak, for example, English, French, or Italian, you will immediately understand that there are masculine words, there are feminine words, and there are neutral words. Uh, which is actually where we get the idea of gender neutral. So, Latino is the male version, Latina is the female version. So another example is actor and actress. The reason that there are two has nothing to do with some sort of value statement about whether you're male or female, it has to do with the Latin origins of the English language. A male is an actor, a female is an actress, a male is a comedian, a female is a comedian. The other definition for gender is to procreate, to engender. So gender is you know, for a man and woman to get together and create another human being. That is gender. Especially when you are young, it is a really good idea to read the dictionary. Partly because illiteracy is rampant in our society. Case in point, gender. People have no idea what it actually means. They just have what they think it means. And that there are lots of those things, further and farther. They get used interchangeably, but they are two distinctly different words with very different meanings. So to illustrate, I would gladly walk with you farther to pursue this conversation further. If you use the word farther, it has to do with a physical distance. For example, Mars is farther away from the Sun than Earth. Further has to do with pursuing some sort of intellectual issue. Pursuing a conversation or an idea. Pursuing a concept. These are things that you take further. It's a really simple delineation, but people get it wrong all the time. Another simple one is just understanding words such as forward, backward, upward, downward, toward. None of those words have an S on the end. They just don't. You know, good spelling is part of literacy. Uh, so let's take a look at some other examples. So that's the dictionary. There is a lot to be gained. And these are just examples of self-help books. This is by C.S. Lewis. It's called Mere Christianity. And this is a good one. You could read it at any age and get value from it, but your attitude has a lot to do with whether you will get value from this book. Because there are people who simply read the title Mere Christianity and they will, oh, I'm not reading that. Okay. That's fine. It actually has nothing to do with Christianity. It has actually nothing to do with religion. In fact, uh, in the beginning of the book, C.S. Lewis makes the point that what he's writing has absolutely nothing to do with any kind of religion. Whether it's Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, uh, anything that is Christianity, it has much more to do with the idea that there actually is right and wrong, and we all know it. 
for those who are immediately clamoring, oh, the guy's are saying you're right or wrong. If somebody ever says to you, there's no such thing as right or wrong, walk up and slap that person in the face and see whether or not they believe there's no such thing as right or wrong. Speaking of which, <laughs> how to win friends and influence people. This one's by Dale Carnegie. It is a classic self-help book. It is something you read to understand how to interact better with people. It is clearly a book that more people should be reading today because you can go to YouTube or the news and see videos of people that are liberals and they're supposed to be, oh, everybody's entitled to an opinion. Everybody's opinion is valid, except for anybody with whom they disagree. On the other side, how to win friends and influence people, folks. You can see videos of groups such as the Oath Keepers actually armed monitoring some sort of event by liberals ready to open fire on fellow citizens of the United States. Yeah. yeah much more simple examples. Uh, Midas Touch. Ben Micellis, the fellow who does Midas Touch, every time he does a video about Donald Trump, it's despicable this and ugly that and all kinds of pejoratives to paint Donald Trump as a really bad guy. Okay, I see, to use the vernacular of these folks, I see that as red meat and dog whistles for your base, Mr. Micellis. And you can immediately turn to somebody like Ben Shapiro. Uh, there's a Mike fellow with a full beard and glasses. There are things that they say that are red meat and dog whistles for their base. Uh, if all you do is tell somebody, you're wrong, you're wrong, you shouldn't do that, you're wrong, how do you expect to have a conversation with that person? How do you expect to find any commonality? Anyway, that's not what I'm here for. Uh, yeah, another video. <laughs> Here's one by uh, Gary Chapman, actually Dr. Gary Chapman, and it's the five love, five love languages. It's all about the ways that people like to have love communicated to them and obviously then the ways that you can communicate love to other people. And it's a great book. Now, that's an example. How to Win Friends and Influence People is an example. These are all examples, actually, of books that you are going to read three, four, five times. You might come back to them every couple of years and reread them to continue getting value from them. It's a matter of taking action, and especially the five love languages. This is a really good book for teenagers to read so that they understand that warm and fuzzy feeling you get, uh, that horniness that you get when you see a guy or a girl that you are really attracted to. None of those are love. Uh, those are lust. Those are desire. You know, it's a, a, a sexual urge. Nothing wrong with that. But love is a much deeper thing. And you know, this is a really good book for teenagers to read. So they start to get an idea <coughs> pardon me, of what love is. And you know, to help themselves distinguish between what they're feeling feeling and what love is because love is very much a choice there are certainly feelings involved but loving someone is a choice and it very often requires effort uh, another one John Maxwell's Failing Forward you know this is a book again great for teens great at any age it is also a book that as you mature, the value that you get from the book also matures. Because one of the things that's required to understand the concept of failing forward 
is the experience of failing and then moving forward. Now, at 10 years of age, yeah, you've had very little of that. At 15 years of age, you've still had very little of it. By the time you get to 20, you've had more. And as you progress through your life, you will have more experience of having made mistakes, how to fix the mistakes, and then move on and move forward. My book, one of my books, Getting Happy When You Wish You Were Dead, <coughs> is about just about what you would think it's about. Uh, it is my life story, and it is about the struggle that I have had around thinking about suicide and contemplating suicide. There are people I know who will get absolutely no value from what I've written because the very idea that someone could contemplate suicide is repugnant to them mostly because they are afraid that they will think about suicide. So who you are, what your attitude is, very much determines whether you will get value from that book. Your age also determines what value you get from it. As a teenager reading it, my hope is that you will understand what I was going through. As a grandparent reading it, my hope is that you will get an idea of what your teenager might be experiencing. Here is a fiction book, Illusions by Richard Bach. Uh, this, oh, by the way, I have every book that I am showing you, I have read What's the minimum? I have read at least three times. That's the minimum. This one, Illusions, we're talking more in the realm of 15, 16 times or more. Here's one that might strike you as an oddity. Sarah Millican's How to Be Champion. And it is her story of rebuilding her life and finding her way to being happy and champion. It's a book I've read uh, four times now, and I think it's well worth reading. But part of it is, you know, here's an example of a female comedian, and there are people who will actually say, the women can't be funny. Well, okay. You know, no one can force you to believe something you have no desire to believe. But Sarah is a very funny woman. She is very funny, very honest. Uh, another one that you will hear me speak about frequently, the success principles. And I'm going to leave that one there because there are two others that I want to cover. The new psychocybernetics, and the reason I have this one is there is a guidebook. There are my notes from an audio program and the printed out PDF of the text of Psycho-Cybernetics. So here's an example of reading the thing, having a guidebook with the thing, and having an audio program with the thing. And I'm moving on because I'm realizing I'm taking a lot of time with these, and this is Mind Over Mood, which is a workbook and I actually took the physical workbook and had it cut and holes drilled so that I could put it into a binder and the reason for that is this workbook has a lot of exercises in it and so what I do is when I want to do exercises from this workbook I take the page out and I photocopy it that way the workbook is always there fresh clean and if I access that workbook 50 more times in my life I will always have clean worksheets and you can be assured I will access that book 50 more times in my life so it's taking action which is affected by I'm just putting the dictionary down because it's heavy and it's sitting in my lap and it's really heavy oh that was the dictionary falling over Here's the thing, I've just shown you a whole bunch of stuff, all right, and people buy books, programs, all kinds of things, and then do nothing with them. 
somehow we get the idea in our head that simply purchasing the thing somehow equals taking action on the information that's in the thing. And an extreme example, a fellow I know, he lives down in Florida, his name is Rich Sheffron. He, several years ago, uh, more than a decade ago, he released a product that was you know, around $4,000 to buy. It came with a binder full of stuff, it came with DVDs, it came with CDs. You know, it was a very complete product. And he sold somewhere in the realm of 2,500 to 3,000 of these products. Now, at four grand each, that's a really good product launch. But the key to this is, about a year after he launched it and sold it, someone reached out to him and said, Rich, hey, you know, I have this program. I realize it's way past, you know, the guarantee and everything. But I finally opened it. I wanted to take action and do something with it and discovered all the CDs and DVDs are blank. Could I ask you to please send me a new one? Rich is the kind of guy he absolutely let's get hold of the fulfillment house, let's get them to produce a new one, send them out a new set of DVDs and CDs. So they call the fulfillment house and say, could you please do this? And please double check, make sure that all the masters are good, and then produce another one. So they did. And it turned out that all the masters were blank. 2,500 to 3,000 of these things sold a year later, one person has opened up the package to find out that everything is blank. All the CDs and DVDs are blank. That's what I mean when I tell you people buy things. I have been in people's houses and on the bottom shelf of the bookshelf I have seen self-help programs still in the cellophane. There's no way for it to do you any good unless you actually consume the information. And once you consume the information, you need to do something with it. If you have a tree in the backyard, you want it down, you are going to go buy an axe. You are going to go buy a chainsaw. Well, if you just go buy the chainsaw and stick it out there next to the tree, is the tree going to come down? No, of course not. You need to know how to use the chainsaw, and then you actually have to use the chainsaw. That's the way life works. You have to do something if you want to get something. Now, <clears throat> that said, here's where it really matters. Here's the the rubber hitting the road as it were. There are some hurdles when you start taking action. The first of which is that we are, as human beings, we are pattern recognition experts. We are also goal striving organisms. Okay? We need a purpose, we need a thing to reach for. All right? So you you get the success principles, and I'm going to use three chapters out of this book. You get the success principles, and so your goal is to be more successful. What exactly does that mean? Well, that's one of the things that you need to take action on. Figure out what is success for you. Is it more money? Is it more friends? Is it more time with your family? What is success? And then, when you start reading, and you start taking action, this is where the pattern recognition steps in. Because you have a way that you have been doing things up until now. That is your pattern. And when you start making changes to it, it is entirely possible that you will rebel against the changes you are making. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but it has to do with congruence, precision, and sincerity. But when you start making changes, 
it is, this is where self-sabotage comes from. You start making changes, and because you're, you are uncomfortable with that change in pattern, you sabotage what it is that you're doing. Also, the people who are in your life recognize your pattern, recognize how it is that you do things. So when you start to change how you do things, they almost certainly will rebel. Now that, whoa, what's this? Even if you are making changes they have asked you to make, think about that for a second. They are asking you to make the change. And then when you start making the change, it's almost guaranteed they will rebel against it. Anyone who is a smoker and has worked at quitting smoking and experiences all the uh, symptoms of withdrawing from nicotine and withdrawing from all the chemicals has, I am sure, experienced people in his or her life saying, oh, please, just smoke a cigarette. Because they would rather have you the way you were than have to deal with this transitional situation. So understand that we are pattern recognition experts and that in the process of doing self-help, you are changing your pattern. So both you and people around you are quite likely to rebel against those changes. It takes time for them to take effect. The other is the society, larger society. And less that somebody, you know, who is a friend is going to recognize your pattern changes and go, what's that? More, there are people in society who believe they know how to live your life better than you know how to live your life. Uh, case in point, you could point to me. That's what I'm doing, showing people how to live a better life. But listen to what I said. I'm showing you how to do things. Whether you want to do them is entirely up to you. How you choose to do them is entirely up to you. Versus the person, uh, we have a situation right now here in Canada because it's June and that's Pride Month, a school board has said, yeah, we choose to not fly the, the Pride flag. When it comes to the flags we put on the flagpole, we'll put up the Canadian flag, we'll put up the provincial flag, and we'll put up the municipal flag. Any other flags, we do not fly them. Any civic sort of flag, we just don't fly civic flags. Oh my. That's, oh, that's causing so much hardship. Huh? Yeah, that's just a case of people saying that they know how to do things better than the school board knows how to do things. What it really amounts to is people with a special interest saying, yeah, but what you're doing somehow fails to serve my special interest. So recognize that, you know, those two things are there. When you're making shifts, you have yourself and the people around you going, eh, that's a new pattern. I'm uncomfortable with that, which is completely natural. And then you have people who are outside of your social sphere who are saying, you know, we think you should be doing something different. We know how to live your life better than you do. So let's look at examples of, of how this manifests itself, okay? And I'm going to take three examples from the success principles. The very first chapter in the success principles is take 100% responsibility for yourself. Wow. There's no end to the list of groups that disagree with that idea. They would much rather blame systemic issues, blame parents, blame where you grew up, blame anything other than the person in the mirror. Do anything other than acknowledge my life today as an adult is a result of the decisions I have made as an adult. Now this is one that really is affected by how old you are. Because under the age of 12, responsibility is kind of a non-issue. Okay, somewhere around the age of 12 is what's called the age of accountability, where you start to recognize, hey, I am responsible for the things that I do. 
Then, as a young adult, basically from around 13 years of age to, you know, 29, 30 years of age, as a young adult, you should be gaining more and more responsibility for yourself and exercising more and more autonomy, making decisions for yourself, so that you come to understand what it means to take 100% responsibility. Well, again, people close to you. There are all kinds of parents today whose sole purpose in life is to remove all of the obstacles for their children. That strikes me immediately as being boneheaded because we are purpose-driven organisms. We need things to achieve. We need obstacles to overcome. It's the way it is. Now, does everybody need to be homeless in life to appreciate some particular aspect of that? No. Do, do people need to miss meals in order to understand what it's like to be so hungry you are unable to focus? No. In the same way, I am a father. I watched my wife give birth. Uh, I have no understanding of what it is like to give birth. I saw it happen. I certainly understand the process. But the pain experienced, the, the effort of pushing a human being out of your body, there's no way for me to understand that because I have never done it. Now similarly, for probably almost every single person watching this video, I have had pericarditis, which is an inflammation of the sac around the heart. And the pain involved in that is, imagine taking the, the smallest breath you can, and that still illuminates the entire outline of your lungs and heart in fiery pain. Simply shifting from sitting in the position I'm in right now and moving forward makes your entire chest light up with fire. It's a lot of pain. Do I think it's like giving childbirth? No. I think it's a lot of pain but I, I see no similarity between that and pushing a human being out of your body. But there are people who, when you say, well, I am going to take 100% responsibility for myself, they will say, oh, well, what about this person having done that? What about this person having done that? I just watched an interview with uh, Pierre Polyver, who is the uh, conservative leader for the Federal Conservative Party. And a reporter asked why someone who is a violent offender and has committed 60 plus crimes continues to commit crimes. And in the reporter's mind you can tell what he's thinking is of a situation like Les Miserables where Jean Valjean steals a loaf of bread because he is starving. And the police inspector chases Jean Valjean literally for the rest of his life uh, because the police inspector eventually ends his life, ends his own life. And the reporter is thinking that it's society's fault that this person is a criminal. Mm, no. It, no. The person is choosing to commit crimes. No matter what your circumstances, even if there is a gun pointed to your head, you have only two, but you have two options. Do as you're told, or die. But you still have options. You still have a choice to make. The difficulty we encounter is that most of the choices we make get made based on the patterns we recognize. They get made in a subconscious, thoughtless way. 
And I don't mean thoughtless as in a disrespectful way. I mean without active thought. And a lot of those patterns, a lot of the things that we do, come, yes, from childhood, and yes, from our teenage years. And we accept those patterns and never bother to go back and question them. Well, that's what self-help is about. It's about questioning them. Now, the next one is about believing in yourself. Believing in yourself is a really good thing to do. It, it, having self-confidence is a really good thing. And that's another example of why you should be reading the dictionary. Self-confidence used to be defined as vanity. If you described yourself as self-confident, you were viewed as being vain. That was the actual definition. It is no longer the definition, because all languages evolve, all languages change over time. English pretty much the most of any language, but they all do. The thing about believing in yourself is you need to understand the difference between self-esteem and self-image. Self-confidence and bravado. Okay, Self-esteem is the opinion you hold of yourself. How you think other people see you. Think about that. How you think other people see you. Self-image is how you see yourself. And I'll give you a great two, actually, two examples. One is gang members. Gang members tend to have very high self-esteem. People respect me. People are afraid of me. People get out of the way when I walk down the street. Oh, I'm this great person but they clearly have a negative self-image because they are committing criminal acts. So they see themselves as a criminal. They see themselves as outside of society. They have a negative self-image, but they have very high self-esteem. Another is a teenager. When I was married, we had three children. And the three kids used to print ITG. I'm the greatest, and put it up all over the place. I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. So they had huge self-esteem. I'm the greatest. That's huge self-esteem. But they had uh, a lot of elements of negative self-image, you know, which is typical for a teenager. There is a lack of confidence, because pretty much everything you do is new. And pretty much everything you do kind of gets screwed up in some way, shape, or form. And even more importantly, when you do make a mistake, ah, you made a mistake! Ah! You know, somebody yells at you, a coach yells at you, the teacher, ah, oh, big red X on the paper, ah! Oh. You know, some teachers, I've seen it, some teachers only put on the test paper the marks you lost. So they'll put uh, minus 15% or you know, minus 20%, whatever it is, rather than putting that you got 80 out of 100. No, they'll put minus 20. Okay, so you are living a life where everybody's focused on when you do a thing wrong. Ah, you did a thing wrong. Ah. Okay, so it's natural for teenagers to lack self-confidence. And it's a big deal when you are reading something like the success principles, and especially when you read the chapter about believing yourself, it starts to talk about being realistic about what you are doing. You need to recognize if you are doing something for the first time, obviously you are in a learning mode. And this is where you need to think about congruence, sincerity, and precision. Congruence I'm a, am I the kind of person who does this thing? Sincerity, do I really want to do this thing? And precision, okay, what exactly is it I'm trying to do? <laughs> okay? And you need those things because you already have a pattern. You already have a way of doing things. You want to achieve a new pattern. Well, to get from here to here, 
the bridge that goes between there is built based on congruence, precision, and sincerity. So I'm, I'm going for this, okay? But I'm over here. First off, if I'm going for this, is that really what I want? Do I want to be better at algebra? Do I want to play basketball? Do, you know, do, is that really the kind of person that I want to ask out on a date? Or am I just doing it because that's a really pretty girl and everybody asks the pretty girl? So, is this really what I want? That's where I'm headed. Is this really, is there congruence? Do I really want that? Well, this is where I am. This is where I'm headed. I'm sorry, where exactly am I headed? So, yes, I want to play basketball, but do I have to be the center of the team? Is defense maybe where I want to start? You know, what is it that I want to do? And just because I start at defense or playing one of the wing positions, maybe eventually I want to play center, but for now, I want this starting position. So you're getting precise about, okay, what is it exactly that you want? And then, sincerity. Okay. I know, I think that's what I want. I have a really good idea of what I want. Now, am I doing this because this is what I want? Or am I doing this because it's what all my friends are doing? It's what my parents expect? It's what my teachers are telling me to do? Is this really me? Or am I doing it to satisfy somebody else? Okay, we're getting there. And I know, I'm, I see the clock. I know exactly how long this is going. I hope you're still with me. <laughs> if you come back and watch this in multiple parts, that's okay by me. Uh, the third one, and it's from here again, is there's a chapter on feedback. And you are going to get feedback. If someone dislikes the pattern that you're exhibiting and they want you to go back to the old one, you are going to get feedback. If somebody sees you making a change and thinks it's a really good change, you will probably get feedback. Notice the difference. If they dislike what you're doing, you will definitely get feedback. If they like what you're doing, you might get feedback. So something that you need to do is find someone with whom you can speak to get feedback. And it will probably be none of your friends, none of your family, maybe a teacher, maybe if you, know, you go to church or mosque or synagogue or whatever, it might be somebody there with whom you can speak. The idea here, <clears throat> and this is something Dan Kennedy taught me, you want a mentor to model and a mentor with whom you can speak. Now, the authors of all these books are great mentors to model. But you do need somebody with whom you can speak. And I, for example, every week I do a study on the success principles with a friend of mine. Her name is Stephanie. And she is in Indiana. I am in Ontario, Canada. So every week, actually in just a little while, we get together via Zoom and we talk about a chapter in the success principles. So you need to find somebody. And if it works out that it's a family member or it works out that it's a friend, that's cool. That's great. When I say that it's unlikely to be, I'm saying for most people, it, those are unlikely candidates for getting good feedback. I want to really quickly review how you handle the hurdles because how you handle them is entirely dependent on your age, your attitude, and your aptitude. So handling hurdles, the younger you are, the harder it can be to handle a hurdle because it's new. It's a new experience. You are reading Psycho-Cybernetics or The Success Principles or Sarah Millican's How to Be Champion. And it's the first time you're reading this. It's new information. So that is a shift of the pattern. That's new. And then you run into 
people telling you that you're wrong, or people giving you bad feedback, or people, you know, somehow denigrating what it is that you're trying to do. Cutting, undercutting your belief in yourself. So, ideally, you experience those things, and you get better at sorting out the information, and as you age, into your 20s, into your 30s, and so on, you get better at handling the hurdles. Now, your attitude is, so for example, I have been doing self-help since I was, for sure, in grade 10, which would have made me 15 years of age. And one of the books that I read, grade 10, uh, the theme in English for grade 10 English when I was in school was Utopia and Dystopia. And one of the books I read was Who Has Seen the Wind? In that book was a word that I had never seen before. Uh, the word is polymath. And to you know, make a quick point of it, a generalist is someone who knows a little bit about a lot of things. An expert is someone who knows a lot about one field of study. A polymath is somebody who knows a lot about a lot of fields of study. And when I read that, and I looked it up in the dictionary, you know, keep in mind, I'm 56. So when I was 15 years of age, the internet had yet to exist. It was there, but it was only government and university facilities that were using it. There was no public internet when I was 15. We're talking the early 80s. I learned all this stuff, but when I was a teenager, I really started getting very, very angry. And when I was in my 20s, I was basically in a rage. So very little of the self-help stuff took because I made very little use of it. After I got out of the military, when I started making changes, more of it stuck with me because I made more use of it. But I can tell you that, for example, this year, which is the second year of Stephanie, Stephanie and I doing the study on the success principles, in our second year, which is 2023, I have made incredible growth in the first six months of this year. As illustrated by the fact that I am now doing these videos. And then there's aptitude, which I just demonstrated because it's how often you consume the material. So I have, before Stephanie and I started the study, I think I had read the success principles twice, maybe three times. And never really read it. Yeah, I read it, but not really. And then, of course, we did a study, so I read the whole book last year, and we're doing the study again this year, and I'm rereading the whole book. And the more often you go through material, the better you understand it, the better you are able to apply it. The better your ability to apply something, the more value you get from it. An illustration, I am a carpenter. When I first started working in construction, I was seven, somewhere around there, maybe six, seven years of age, and my sole task working with my father in construction was to take the boards that he piled up and pound out the nails. That's all I did. Now, I can do a little bit more than just pound out nails. So, you know, how often you consume the material has an influence on how much value you can get from it. Big important note. Thinking that you can read a book once and get all the value from it that it has to offer. Yeah. No. Now, you can read a book, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, Childhood's End. It's a science fiction novel. You can read that book, put it down, never read it again. Because it's a fiction novel. It's for entertainment. If you read it for entertainment and you were entertained, there you go. You got value. Illusions. You could read that for entertainment. Put it down, never read it again. 
On the other hand, if you are into philosophy, you might read it 2, 3, 4, 20, 50 times. I don't know. The Success Principles is a book that you might read, just as I'm doing, once a year, in, you know, in an ongoing basis. Now, the last thing to cover is the need to separate your purpose from their proselytization. I know. What does proselytization mean? Hmm. Ever hear of a dictionary? Yeah. Proselytization. P-R-O-S-E-L-Y-T-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Proselytization. Look it up. Basically, it's somebody trying to get you to think the same way they think. Uh, case in point, the Mormons. They come, they knock on your door, they sit down and have tea, and they try to persuade you to, you know, join the Mormons, to think the way they think. Another good example is NLP, Neural Linguistic Programming. Fantastic tool. It is a tremendous benefit, or it is of tremendous benefit, when you are trying to understand how someone else is thinking. It's also a tremendous benefit when you're using it to help persuade somebody to make a better choice. And that's where NLP sometimes is used for nefarious purposes. Salespeople very often will study NLP because it makes them more effective at making sales. When their only interest is making sales, rather than is this purchase the best thing for this person to do right now? So you need to be paying attention. When you, you know, you're, going, you're over here and you want to go over here and you're listening to John Maxwell, Jack Canfield, Conrad Hall, whoever it is, whoever you are listening to, you need to stop and think, okay, what is it that I want? What do I want to get? And then look at the person who's talking to you and ask, are they helping me get to what I want? Or are they, uh, for example, people who, who teach um, that God is basically a genie and you just have to phrase it the right way. You just have to believe hard enough. Oh, you just need to believe. And it, it will come true for you. Part of the reason they do that is because if it fails to come true, they can say, well, you failed to believe hard enough. The fault lies entirely with you. All right, that's proselytization. They, they're trying to get you to think the way they think so that you, that, that you will do what they want you to do and behave how they want you to behave. I certainly want you to make better choices. I want you to make good choices. My vision is for a world connected by healthy relationships, powered by personal responsibility, and supported by community accountability. And so, am I attempting to proselytize you toward that way of thinking? Absolutely. If you dislike that way of thinking, if you dislike the idea of having healthy relationships, if you dislike the idea of taking responsibility for yourself and your actions, if you dislike the idea of being accountable to the people around you, then clearly we have a bad fit. And you are welcome to go elsewhere. Similarly, if you think those are good things, that you want healthy relationships, you want to take personal responsibility, and you want people around you to hold you accountable, then we have a good fit. So in that case, your purpose and my proselytization line up. In the other purpose, they clearly do not. And yeah, that brings me to the end. Wow, this has been a long one. A quick way to kind of verify whether somebody is actually trying to do what they say they're trying to do. When you read their book, do they cite other sources? Do they cite other works? 
that support what they are saying. So if someone says, uh, for example, and this is one that I will do a video on, when somebody like Pete Buttigieg says that his being homosexual is a decision made at a higher pay grade than his, you know, he's basically saying, well, God made me this way, so it's wrong of you to question it because God made me this way. Okay, except all of the science says genetics really plays no or very small role in the whole idea of being homosexual. In the same way that being white is a birth defect. Surprise! For all you white supremacists out there, being white, the lack of melanin, or melatonin, melanin, in your skin is actually a birth defect. If you're, oh, how could that possibly be true? Ask yourself this. Have you ever, if two people from Sweden, are they likely or even capable of giving birth to a child with colored skin? No. On the other hand, take two people from the United States, both of whom have colored skin, but also have a mixed heritage. So there's some white folks in their background. They can get together, both have colored skin, and give birth to a white baby. That lack of melanin, that's actually a recessive gene. So anyway, there you go. I bet I've managed to aggravate quite a few folks with this one. If you have questions, if you have comments, put them down below. Uh, for everyone who wants to be a troll and be mean and nasty, uh, farfig nougan you, meh. Go ahead, leave your comments. <laughs> I, I, I really don't envy you. I have been doing humor for most of my life. I've been doing sarcasm my entire life. Uh, you should honestly hope that you make your comment and fail to get noticed. But go ahead, make it anyway. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up. If you don't like this video, piss me off and hit the thumbs up anyway. Leave a comment. Please do subscribe. That's, that's wonderful. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye now.